There are many ways of analyzing qualitative data, and coding is just one of them. To make matters more complex, within coding itself, there are many approaches and techniques. This video presents one way of undertaking coding and analysis, and will focus on some of the best known approaches. I heavily rely on one particular publication for this video, as I found it to be very useful and which has informed my own understanding of coding. This is Saldana's The Coding Manual for Qualitative Researchers, and we have the third edition from 2016 in the library in print version. Please take note that this video deals with data analysis after all data has been collected and not with a grounded theory approach where data is coded early to inform the next step in the data collection and which uses the constant comparative method. I might have to disappoint anyone who was hoping to be able to find a precise step-by-step -step manual. But even though Saldana does provide as much of a manual as he can, when it comes to approaches and techniques, the actual interpretation of the data is just that. There is no one correct understanding. This is both the beauty and the curse of qualitative data. Saldana defines a code in qualitative inquiry as a word or short phrase that symbolically assigns a summative, salient, essence capturing and or evocative attribute for a portion of language-based or visual data. To illustrate what this means, think of famous movies. A good film title captures the essence of what the film is about. It reflects what the writers have interpreted as significant to the story and gives meaning to the content. Coding does more than labelling, though. Richards and Morse state that coding is not just labelling, it is linking. To quote, it leads you from the data to the idea and from the idea to all the data pertaining to that idea. We do this because what we seek in the data are patterns and vice versa. Patterns are links in the data that tell us something significant about our research question. These patterns allow us to develop themes, which are theoretical constructs supported by the data. Or as Seal described it, quote, a theme reflects the significance of a pattern within the data in relation to the research question. To get from the codes to the theme, we use categories to help us narrow down and identify the patterns. Some concise definitions for codes, categories and themes are as follows. Bearing in mind that codes are more than mere labels, SEAL's short and to the point definition is nevertheless one to remember. A code is a descriptor of a data segment that assigns meaning. Note the meaning. For example, in your interview data, your respondent, a teacher, said, I give up. You might code this as teacher resignation. Let's say you have dozens of codes. You will soon find that a variety of them may be categorized under one banner. Categories are more conceptual and abstract than codes. And once again, it is up to you, the researcher, on how you categorize the codes. I don't want to worry anyone with the no one meaning angle, as there are techniques that help you find your path, such as the very important one of writing analytical memos. The handout has more on this. As an example for categories, let's take the teacher resignation code from earlier. You might also have one that is teacher joy and one that is teacher striding. All of these might be put together under the teacher behavior category. As for themes, which develop out of the patterns, we find SEAL sees them as theoretical constructs that explain similarities or variations across codes. DeSantis and Ugaritza go a bit more into detail and define a theme as an abstract entity that brings meaning and identity to a recurrent patterned experience and its variant manifestations. As such, a theme captures and unifies the nature or basis of the experience into a meaningful whole. And here we have it again, the emphasis on meaning, now with the added dimension of the whole. A theme develops out of the codes, 
via the categories. I'm going to show an example of coding using three different coding methods, which are the most widely used ones. The following definitions are from Saldana. Descriptive coding, which assigns labels to data to summarize in a word or short phrase, most often a noun, the basic topic of a passage of qualitative data. In vivo coding, which uses words or short phrases from the participant's own language in the data record as codes, may include folk or indigenous terms of a particular culture, subculture or microculture to suggest the existence of the group's cultural categories. Emotion coding, which labels the emotions recalled and or experienced by the participant or inferred by the researcher about the participants. The following example is a short extract from a response to the sample interview question, can you tell me about a memorable learning experience in your life? Respondents were asked this single question for the purpose of creating a set of interview data to be used in teaching. It was not part of a research project. In Saldana's words, descriptive coding summarizes in a word or short phrase, most often as a noun, the basic topic of a passage of qualitative data. Descriptive coding is one of the most basic coding techniques and useful for all sorts of data and all coding experiences. I found of particular interest here the descriptions of how the teacher humiliates the student by dismissing them, which causes anger. An anger that is still strong at the time of the interview. Sharmas, when writing about coding techniques for grounded theory, describes in vivo codes as helping us to preserve participants' meanings of their views and actions in the coding itself. This is especially important when collecting data from cultures or subcultures that are using a different terminology or slang words. In vivo codes are rarely final codes requiring further analytical elevation. In this example, the use of the expletive is particularly interesting because the participant is recalling an event from their childhood and they are still that angry about it, though aware of the professional setting and thus telling the researcher to edit the expletive out if they wish, they are still using it. Emotion coding is part of the effective coding techniques and Saldana describes it as labeling the feelings participants may have experienced or are inferred by the researcher about the participant. One thing to remember when emotion coding is that when anger, angry, mad or similar codes are present, that anger is a consequential emotion. A triggering emotion precedes it, such as embarrassment, anxiety or shame. This is evident in the example when the respondent repeatedly comments on the anger at the dismissive attitude of the teacher, in front of fellow students no less, and they feel humiliated or embarrassed. The anger expressed actually progresses from angry to so angry to using an expletive to express their fury at the past situation. All three coding techniques point out anger over the dismissal of a student as a strong emotion, which is caused by feelings of humiliation of that student. The correlation of dismissal, humiliation and anger is something I would be interested in exploring further, especially aspects of selfhood of learners and respect in a learning and teaching environment.